we're back. We're live. It's uh, 12 o'clock noon, and we have a wonderful show on the military in Hawaii. We're going to talk about the Armed Forces YMCA with his executive, uh, Lori Moore. Hi, Lori. Hello, Jay. Thanks for having us today. And we have uh, General Dan Fig Leaf. I, I like the way you put that in quotes, Dan, yeah. um, who used to be APCSS for quite some time, and now he's uh, the chair mm -hmm. Uh, of of the board of the uh, Armed Forces Y, among other things. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Lori. Good to see you, Jay. Thank you. So let's talk about let's talk about uh, the structure of the of the Armed Forces Y. I mean, it goes way back deep. You know, I mean, the Armed Forces Y, one form or another, has existed in these islands since the Armed Forces came here. And I couldn't say that it was at that time, but I know that the Navy first set up shop at Pearl Harbor in 1850. So it couldn't have been too long after that. Wow. So talk about what it is today, Lori. So you're right, Jay. We've been here since 1917, serving our military here in Hawaii. And, you know, part of what we do is, is remaining relevant in the moment, always, whether it's 1917 or 2020. And uh, so our mission has obviously changed a lot over the years. We kind of started out with a great building downtown. Anyone who knows um, what's now the Hawaii State Art Museum used to be one of our buildings. And uh, we used to have, you know, dances and, and affordable food and a place for our, our military to stay overnight and kind of get away from it, relax and recoup. And um, as, as things changed, we moved on base and our, our focus became a lot about the military family in addition to the actual service member. And so now our programs are really about education and social social services and things like that. So uh, yeah, I think there's a big uh, point to be made here that you are serving, at least for the most part, active duty military and their families. But I imagine you also serve pe you know, people who were active duty and who have been released from the service, discharge from the service, uh, but still consider themselves um, military, you know, military veterans of one kind or another. Am I right about that? Far. And in fact, we do have some veteran services along with, um, you know, we, we, we provide services to those that are DOD civilians uh, working on base. And so our education programs and our social service programs expand to both of those. So and what would you, what would you say the mission is? I mean, what exactly, what do you hope to achieve by this, and I know that it evolves over the years. It was one thing, you know, in World War II. It's another thing now. What what is it now? You know, Jared, our tagline is strengthening the military ohana here in Hawaii, and that's really what we do. And it's really about finding ways to do that in the moment and helping them meet the challenges of you know serving in our military and and helping them be recognized for the sacrifices. Yeah. Uh, General Leaf, it's such a it's such a pleasure to see you. You are Great kind of a sight for sore eyes. Uh, I've, I've admired you for years, and um, I, you know it's nice to see that you're on this board, because I'm you know as a as a retired flag officer, you bring so much to the table in in terms of dealing with um, you know that mission. Can you talk about your life and experience on the board? Well, I uh, frankly wasn't interested in joining the board because I, I, after I left APCSS in uh, uh, January of 2017, I spent a lot of time writing and did some traveling, consulting on conflict resolution and, you know, I, I had enough to do. But then a friend of mine, uh, you may have known Lieutenant General Retired Jeff Remington, who was here as the Northrop Grumman corporate rep and was also my predecessor on the chairman of the board of management. He roped me into it, and it's the best rope that's ever been thrown around me. Once I saw both the organization and the board, I, I couldn't not join. It's a dynamic organization you know, from 1915 on. It's very responsive to the needs of the military community. And um, I'm sure it was here serving the sailors who my dad taught chemistry when he was a Navy ensign in Hawaii in 1946 uh, but it's a great organization the board of management is not it, that's a better name than board of directors because we have an executive director who does a wonderful job and, <laughs> and we'll try not to puff her up too much but she's that's a compliment Lori. yeah <laughs> Lori is incredible um 
but we try to help with the management and help uh, the armed services YMCA. We all occasionally slip up and say armed forces YMCA to um, <laughs> meet the challenges that they've got. So for uh, for example, right now we have an ad hoc committee on the future of education because many of our programs for the KK involve uh, early education. So we've got people with an educational background, including me from my time at APCS, and I consult for an adaptive learning company now, who just come together and try to see the idea, Ben, for Lori, as we try to think about what our educational programs will look like post COVID and into the next decade. Um, so there are other financial and things like that that go to, but it, it's a great board. I'm very, uh, I tell them that at the end of every meeting because it, the members are very diverse, but they all care so much about the good work of Armed Services YMCA Hawaii. What, what, what's the, um, you know, diversity of the board? I mean, what kinds of people are on the board to join you? Well, there's uh, people like me, a couple retired military, certainly not the majority. Um, some former educators, some people with a finance background, but they're all community and business leaders. Uh, additionally, the spouses of all of our component commanders are part of the board as well. And that gives, that gives us a great benefit. I, what we get from the spouses of the commanders is insight and access that we wouldn't otherwise have. And that's a longstanding approach that we've taken. Lori, I assume we've been doing that as long as you've been associated with Armed Services Y. So it's it's a diverse board. I'm part of several boards of advisors, directors, and everything else. They're all fine. But this one is special because of the unselfish commitment that each of the members makes to the organization. Yeah, I, I later on in the program, I do want to talk about the military in general as a special mm -hmm. culture in our country. Uh, but Laurie, let's talk about your activities. What kind of activities do you organize? What kinds of events? Um, what kind of you know gatherings, uh, educational experiences do you do you create? Um, and how are those things affected by COVID? Well, everything is affected by COVID, that's for sure. But um, we have a lot of early education programs. And, and one of the reasons we do that is because when our military moves to Hawaii, um, in order to participate in early education, so we're talking pre-K programs and earlier, there's generally very long wait lists out in the community. Um, and, and they're quite expensive. And so we work to provide those on a basis, more of a rotating basis, because all of our members are military. So we do have people PCSing in and out, which makes space available. Um, our wait lists are not quite as long as out in the community. And of course, our fees are less. Um, we are focusing right now on a, a parent participation preschool. Um, and we do that because we like to involve the parents. For one, it's, it's a great benefit to the child. But two, it really helps create community among some of these military spouses. And you know, if you're new here and you've just moved here, sometimes it's difficult to meet folks, especially if you're not living on base and you're out in town. And so this gives them an opportunity to meet other military spouses, um, you know, find things in common and, and create their own community, which I think is a huge benefit when we're talking about strengthening families. Um, some of our other programs were after school programs that we participate in uh, in the public schools. Those are on a hiatus right now. Uh, we're hoping to bring those back. We're in conversations about bringing those back in the spring. Um, but a lot of that is, is focused around deployment support. And what we know is that, you know, when kids are maybe struggling because mom or dad is deployed or they're, they've just moved here to Hawaii and maybe that's their, you know, fifth move in as many years. And, and it begins to take a toll both academically and, and socially, emotionally. So this program is really uh, geared towards addressing both of those aspects of a child's life. So one-on-one -on -one homework help and tutoring, in addition to really kind of addressing some of the social emotional issues that a child may experience. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I wanted to ask you about the facilities you have. You mentioned there are a lot of them and uh, 
Uh, I'd like to start off with saying that when I was uh, in the service in the time of Vietnam, I was on the Armed Forces Disciplinary Control Board. And the Armed Forces Y there on Hotel Street was a target of our inquiry on a regular basis because very strange things happened in that building. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, we, we, we worked to keep a lid on things. It was, you know, an historic place where Frank Sinatra and Ernest Borgnine and uh, Montgomery Cliff, uh, they all made a movie there back, back when. What was it, um, gee whiz? Um, I remember the, on the beach and, and uh, yeah, it'll come back, back to me. Um, a very famous movie back when, back, black and white. So that, you gave that up. It had a tremendous uh, legacy, a tremendous history. Uh, and now you're on the bases. Can you talk about what bases uh, you're on, what, what facilities you have where? Yes, we can. So we have a, a full complement of programs and services at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, as well as Schofield Wheeler and Marine Corps Base Hawaii. Uh, we also have programs over at AMR, Aliamanu Military Reservation, and we specifically have programs there because folks can walk to it. You know, it's very, very close there in the housing area and we're within walking distance. Uh, we offer children's waiting room at Tripler, for example. So we're up at Tripler and Schofield Clinic as well. And that particular program allows a military parent or dependent or even a, a dependent sibling to attend a, a medical appointment. And the well child is, is cared for in our waiting room and doesn't you know, necessarily have to go wait with mom and dad for, for a medical appointment and is kept safe and, and healthy and away from germs, which is very important right now. So do you uh, visit all these places? Um, do, you, do you make the, the rounds? I do, I do. I do my best to ever. do that. And, and actually I love uh, seeing our participants and our staff and um, it does keep me busy because I, I put some miles on my car going from place to place, but um, you know, it's, it's so worth it. And, and we love our military family so much. Uh, we'll bend over backwards for them. You have staff. Um, how big is your staff and how many of them are volunteers and how, how many are, you know, full-time or part-time staff? So full-time staff, we're, it's, it's pretty small, about eight folks. And we've got about 30 part-time staffers. Some of them work at, uh, you know, more than one facility. Um, and last year i don't have the numbers for this year quite yet but last year we had over 1200 volunteers through the course of the year so we do rely 12, on 1200 oh wow yeah do you rely well, on that's right. are those volunteers from from the military or are they from the community in general or what both both so a lot of times we'll do ohana food drops and uh, that's become an important program over the last several months during covid and uh, we've distributed over 100,000 pounds of food since april and we've had a lot of community volunteers take part in that, either doing food drives or actually distributing the food, uh, you know, just wanting to be part of that and, and assist where they can. That's great. So, General, um, by the way, I remember the name of the movie. It was From Here to Eternity. Yeah. And uh, I, I that was on the tip of my brain, too, Jay, and it didn't come up. <laughs> Burt Lancaster was in there also. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I wanted to I wanted to ask, you know, so we have um, what amounts to a, a social safety net kind of organization here. Um, there are many or, you know, there are actually hundreds of social safety organizations in Hawaii that do sure. things like this. But it strikes me that the people in the military are, you know, a different community um, and they're going to be and I know for a fact they're going to be more comfortable with an organization of the military for the military than they would be for an, you know, an all purpose safety net kind of nonprofit. What do you think about that? Is that, is that part of the discussion you have with your board? Well, we all like being comfortable in our surroundings and you're most comfortable with, with the world you know and they know the military world. So sure, it doesn't mean they don't get support from other community service organizations, but it's comfortable and accessible because the on-base presence so um, I think that is part of it. Uh, they also uh, had, get some additional comfort through the association of the parents that are involved with their kids and the programs. And that's something we see that, that's lost a bit during COVID when our operations are somewhat constrained because the military parents, so you're a mom who's got a, uh, her husband is deployed and 
is feeling the stress of that and another mom is in the same boat. It's a way to connect uh, while your kids are doing whatever. So very high comfort level, everything's tailored to them by people who know what their needs are and we stay in touch with their needs. Um, and I, so I think it's, it's a place that feels like home yeah. to the military families. Yeah, and the military families have special challenges that are, you know, exclusive to them, unique to them. Um, but then I wanted to ask you also, I mean, how do you, how do you raise the money, pay the staff, um, make the arrangements, you know, uh, whatever they are? You know, a lot of things Lori is going to be able to get from volunteers and community organizations that would like to contribute for the cause, but uh, you still need money. How do you raise yeah. it? Where, where do you get it from? So um, would you, would it be untoward to put the, Armed Services YMCA.org website up there, but through donations, individual donations, and and also get some return on the building sale back from the National Armed Services YMCA, which was uh, which is, their board is headed by Vice Admiral Retired Bill French, and uh, then donations. Now with COVID, we took a big hit in that because in November we had the best funding fundraising event ever. I know that because I've been to most of them in the islands, it seems. We have a breakfast where we honor uh, a member of the military service plus Coast Guard plus National Guard and their family for their community service. And the winners are always inspiring and compelling. And it's a gala breakfast. What's the name of the website? It's asymcahi.org. We did, uh, Jay, we did uh, do a virtual breakfast. We honored in a COVID safe manner, the recipients who are all wonderful. The, some of the commanders opened their homes up for a small responsible gathering. They still got their gift baskets, which are best gift baskets ever, and were appropriately recognized. And then say to your non-military listener who says, well, what's this have to do with me? In addition to having over 36,000 active duty and over 9,000 uh, reserve and guard folks stationed in Hawaii. Um, they're your neighbors and you're, they're good citizens and um, they, uh, the, they're they part of the community. You'd appreciate what great citizens they are when you saw the good work that the military member and their spouse have done for the community that got them recognized by Armed Services YMCA Hawaii. Yeah, you're you're touching into a very important part of Hawaii culture. Um, you know, the military has been here for hmm, 150 years or more. Um, make that 170 years. Um, and the military is infused into Hawaii. Uh, and it's not just historical. It's day to day. It's not just being consumers mm -hmm. and a part of the, uh, you know, what want to call it the, uh, the customer economy. It's it's being part of the uh, the whole culture. I mean, it, you know, you could swing a cat in any direction. There's a military person or family around you participating in the economy and the community the same way. And furthermore, like you, General, there are tons and tons and tons of people who have come out of the military and made their lives here um, and retire here. And so it, you, and you have a constant. Yeah, go ahead. It's not just generals and admirals, you know, the Ralph, the guy who used to do my pest control servicing for many years was a retired NCO and he and I share had a lot in common, not just our Air Force background, but we both come to and fallen in love with Hawaii. And many of us do. The other thing I'd say, I'd make two other points. One is uh, the deliciousness of Hawaii is the diversity of the population. I mean, that's what's truly unique. The beautiful, it's a beautiful place, but the population is aloha. Um, and you get an extraordinarily diverse group in the military members and their families. And they're a group that's generally traveled the world. I've been to 72 countries. Maybe they all haven't been to 72 countries, but they bring global experiences and share that with their friends and neighbors. And that's, that's good for our islands. But I'd also say that that they faced many of the same challenges that uh, other uh, folks have in the islands uh, during COVID. Um, yes, the military members still have a job and that's safe, 
But many of them, especially the enlisted, are dependent on dual income because you're not getting rich in the in the military, and this is an expensive place to live. So when the spouse loses their uh, part-time or full-time employment due to COVID, that has a big, big impact, and it's another part of the reason that they need the Armed Services YMCA safety net. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, in in the uh, in the engagement, in the contiguous engagement or the integrated engagement of the military and the civilian community, I mean, two issues have come up in the past year or so that I, I'd like to ask you, for you whether you've been thinking about this and what your reaction is. One is, to the extent we have a disaster, um, it, it doesn't have to be COVID, but it might be. Uh, it could be extreme weather. It could be some effect of climate change where the, where the state is in dire straits and the state needs help. Um, some people say here in Hawaii that we can count on the military. They need, they, they need to, to help us. That's part of their mission to help us in, in dire consequences. Other people say, no, the military has its own mission. Um, and they, they're not, you know, you can't count on, you know, the military being there and wrapping the community, wrapping around the community in, in case of an emergent set of circumstances. What are your thoughts about that? I think that in any major disaster in Hawaii, the military will play a very important role in response and recovery. There'll be some limits to what capacity they have and what's legal just under the, the structure of federal armed forces and what they're allowed to do in a community. But we're here. There's another part of that that makes me so even more certain. And that is the extraordinarily tight relationships between the community and the military leaders and including the National Guard and uh, the oh, yeah. emergency preparation folks. and. It, it's better than anywhere I've served. Really? And I still know the folks who are involved in it. And, you know, we love this place uh, and we love the people. It, and that can sound a little fluffy. It's not. If, if they can help, whatever help can be provided, will be provi provided. And I'm certain it will be substantial. The other question I wanted to pose to you, Lori, I'll, I'll come back to you in a moment. <laughs> this is for the general. <laughs> Is um, you know over the course of this administration, uh, people were concerned that uh, the military would be would 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 protect a president who didn't want to leave office. That may be moot now, okay. But but people raised the question. They said you know if he if he as a commander in chief called on the military to you know prevent a transition of, of power, um, it, it was a question as to whether the military would take instructions, take orders from him as a commander in chief, or whether they would, they would dig in and say, no, we can't, it's not a legal order. We can't do that. And I, you know, right, it's, I think the emergent, the, the concern about that is past. I think most people feel now that the military would not do that. Um, General Milley is, is one person I think who makes that clear, who made that clear. But I wonder, you know, about your thoughts about that. I mean, the military traditionally in this country, in this democracy, has been apolitical. Um, and yet we, we've seen that tested over the course of the last few years. And I wonder what your thoughts are on where we stand with respect to that issue. Well, first of all, I'd take exception with your premise and say that we've tested, been tested on that over the last couple of centuries. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a dynamic tension. Yes. But whether it's a your question point, of being I take too, your point, too, yeah. too loyal or not loyal enough, but it goes to our oath of office where we are called upon to obey all lawful orders. And we have a strong sense on what lawful orders are. All military members are uh, required to refresh themselves on the Constitution annually. And um, I have some friends in China who I talk with occasionally, and they kind of ask the same question. I said, Okay, first of all, I personally know several of the service chiefs. But even if I didn't, I'd say you're worrying for nothing. That's not how we are. Now, many uh, retired flag and general officers have become more active politically than they have in the past. That's not for me. You know, every time I write a paper, a op ed like was in the Star Advertiser uh, 10 days ago or so on North Korea, the last proofread is to make sure you can't tell what my politics are. Because mm -hmm. I just don't think it's appropriate. I'm not taking issue with those who do, but but on active duty, we follow the law. We execute our oath of office. 
and uh, do our duty and whatever uh, that duty calls. Thank you for that. Thank, you, thank you for that. That's, really appreciate that on all levels. So, Lori, just come back to you for a minute. How do I get your job, Lori? What do I have to <laughs> No chance, Jay. No chance. <laughs> what do I study? What do I have to learn? What do I have to do to get a job like yours? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, I'll tell you, um, I come from a family of, of service kind of oriented individuals, and that's what we do. Um, my husband's a retired Marine. I've got a, our oldest son is a, a first lieutenant in the Marine Corps. Is that right? And our youngest son is a senior in college contemplating joining the Marine Corps. So, um, you know, I come from a family of service and, and my role as a military spouse, um, besides having my own career and working, you know, was, was to support those around me and to support other military spouses. And I feel very strongly about that because one thing we know for sure, and that is military families serve alongside the military member. Yep. And so for me, it's a, a great pleasure to be able to continue that work in this capacity. Um, and you can't have my job, Jay. I really like and, it. And, and Jay, I, I'm going to interrupt and say, I'm not sure you want her job. She worked really hard. And she's led our response to COVID. And we talked about the comfort of the families. One of the reasons they're comfortable with our services YMCA is the extraordinary care they took in all of the post virus sanitization, isolation, et cetera. Um, she's done a great job. And the whole team has. Yeah, but when you, when you go down to one of the facilities, you feel it and it's not, you don't feel a burden, you feel their commitment. Jay, for so, uh, us, getting, getting back operating as quickly as possible was really important because we knew um, as far as our military families, offering our programs again and our services again was important to kind of their bounce back and, and you know, an aspect of resilience for them. And so we worked very hard to get operating as quickly as possible. And, and our team has done a fantastic job. Uh, one, one, thing, uh, one thing I feel strongly about, and I'm wondering how you feel coming from a, a family surrounded by military, um, is I, I, I thought that um, uh, ending the, the draft in the 70s was a mistake. And I think national service is, is a very worthy, important thing for any country, especially this country. Um, if it was up to me, I would, I would put the draft back in, back in operation again. What about you? How do you feel about that? From a personal standpoint, I would absolutely support national service uh, for any of our individuals. I mean, how do you value a country and how do you value your freedoms and rights if you don't have the opportunity to protect those? And I think it's a great lesson for everyone. Um, and male or female, I think national service is, is really important, whatever that looks like. Okay, I, I really would I like the a, general to weigh in on uh, that. He wants to weigh in. <laughs> no <laughs> doubt, I will. Jay, uh, first of all, my um, son is retired Air Force. My daughter was an Air Force uh, uh, intelligence officer for six years. She's married to an Air Force fighter pilot turned test pilot, which is proof that she doesn't really hate her father. And uh, <laughs> two of my brothers served in the Air Force. Um, so, yeah, we believe in service. But... The draft isn't coming back. And I think at, at this time, starting with or highlighted by the George Floyd situation, it's a good time to talk about the burden we have as leaders to help our military look as much like it's our society as possible at all levels. And that doesn't just happen. And you don't fix everything uh, by the promotion of one or two, the room has to look like our country. Yes. Part of that is we'll make better decisions. Diversity yes. does enable better decision making. If you're all the same background and think the same way, you're not going to come up with very innovative answers. Uh, but the other part of it is we have parts of our society that are absolutely not invested in national security. And the uh, cliche, they don't have skin in the game. In this case, we mean real skin, the skin of their sons and daughters. So uh, I applaud the military's efforts to 
to promote diversity, to get to underrepresented elements of society, we can't draft them. That's just not going to happen. I don't, I don't think it's a realistic hope. So the burden's on us. I, I couldn't disagree with any of that. So General Leaf, I really appreciate you coming around. It's really wonderful to see you and talk to you. And, and, and thank you for tolerating my questions too. Yeah. <laughs> and you too, Always Lori. <laughs> thank you for coming around and having this conversation and tolerating our, my questions. And I hope we can do this again and, and, and dig deeper and, uh, you know, and, and, and see how you're doing going forward. Thank you so much and stay safe, you guys. Lori, relief. Happy Thanksgiving. Everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Aloha. <laughs>